hold on. Uh, so, okay. Yep. So, uh, you know, RX is always being is being touted as a solution for the problem of traffic. But I guess we have to critically examine this question and uh, the response. If Parex is the answer, what is the question? If Parex is the solution, what is the problem? So um, one way to uh, do this, to inspect this further, is to use uh, quantitative methods. One of the methods that I've been using, uh, I've been practicing, uh, is it's called space syntax. And uh, what it is, it's spatial network analysis. And it allows us to actually uncover a lot of latent patterns, uh, underlying patterns of behavior uh, within the space of cities that actually we realize drives a lot of our uh, social and environmental conditions in our cities. So um, I'll start off with this image because this is the core of Metro Manila within the C5 uh, region. And you'll see that Metro Manila in effect actually has a broken heart. Uh, this is this is a uh, integration analysis of uh, 2.5 kilometers, and you'll see how the river, Pasig River, in a way, uh, fragments and fractures the city, the metro, the uh, urban core, into two, a uh, northern and a southern half. And that's actually how we feel and experience the city. If you pass through EDSA or any of the radial roads that connect. Uh, connect northern, northern and southern halves. That's exactly how we experience the city because whenever you pass by Pasig River, all of a sudden um, there's a dearth of activity. There's a lack of any vibrancy or, or activity unless you actually go down to the neighborhood level of, of uh, these, the river banks of Pasig River. Uh, so Pasig River behaves like a bisector. So this is zooming in and you'll see that a lot of our uh, private CBDs are clustered on the out outer edges and the traditional downtown and cores of our city are, are found uh, closer to, to Intramuros. No? And you'll see how the river winds and uh, defines that, that fracturing between the two. Compare this to how uh, Paris uh, uh, behaves, the core of Paris behaves. And you'll see that the, the heart or the liqueur of Paris uh, uh, spans both sides of the Seine, the Seine River uh, with multiple bridge crossings and riverside promenades. Um, when Daniel Burnham and uh, uh, Daniel Burnham uh, came over during the first wave of uh, American colonization, he said that uh, Manila is unique because it has the river of Paris, the Bay of Naples and the canals of Venice. And um, I think it's appropriate to hearken back and to use these examples as a way of reminding us of what we've lost or what we, what we could gain if we could re, uh, reassess and approach the problem of traffic from a different angle, which is from land use and uh, uh, densification. So before, before I go into our contemporary uh, issues, I have to trace back to what happened before. And because you realize that a lot of this fracturing has roots back in our history. Um, Intramuros is uh, Spanish Manila's colonial fortress, and you'll see that the Spanish laid it out as, a, as supposed to be the heart of the, of the city, but what you'll see is that it's actually buffered on by the Pasig River and by the Luneta, uh, the, the water feature of Luneta, uh, and you'll see how it's centrally located, but it's actually standing off from everyone else. Uh, <clears throat> The interesting thing is, if you do spatial analysis of Metro Manila, of, of his, historic uh, Manila, you'll see that it's actually not Intramuros that's the heart of the city, but it's actually Binondo. And part of the reason why Binondo succeeded as, a, as the integration core and became the natural Chinatown or the natural trading center for Manila is because of the sheer volume of, um, uh, the, the sheer amount of bridge crossings that connect uh, Binondo to the other parts of the city and across the river to Intramuros. And you'll see those bridge crossings here, no? Uh, these are all encircled in red. And this drives a lot of why, I mean, influences how Binondo became the true spatial integration core of the city and not Intramuros, despite the assertions of uh, colonial control of, of the Spanish uh, 
uh, settlers. And this leads us to how uh, Calle Escolta and uh, Ongpin actually became the uh, prime shopping streets of, of, our, of our historic downtown. Uh, you know, just a funny bit of trivia, Escolta became, uh, became a prime shopping street because part of the and reason is because it's named after the Spanish royal escorts, which are camped out in Callejon Soda, which is this triangle here, just off Escolta. And the reason why uh, uh, shoppers felt safe, I mean, just the co co colonist shoppers and, and, you know, all these foreigners felt safe is uh, they could transact uh, with convenience because the royal escorts were just nearby. So in a way, Escolta behaved like the first uh, uh, shopping mall or uh, secured shopping mall of, of, of the colonial era. So this obviously spills over to our American uh, period. Now, interesting thing about uh, Binondo and San Nicolas, you'll see the Alcacera de San Fernando, which is a, a silk market no, of of the uh, Sangli Chinese Filipinos traders who who used the Pasig River and traded by water with uh, with China, and you'll you'll see that the Alcacera is located off the core of Binondo, uh, and you'll see that it's not very accessible. And part of this is part. This actually hints to another reason why Binondo is so, so important is because uh, if you look at Venice. Um, much of its uh, much of its uh, uh, spatial network is actually connected to the water, and if you follow the same approach that uh, Dr. Sofia Sara, one of my professors uh, at UCL, took uh, when she integrated the canals of Venice as part of the social the spatial network, you see that um, uh, Manila actually in, uh, integrates even better when you factor in Pasig River and the, and the Esteros as part of the spatial network. And you see how important the Alcaceras location is and the Puerto de Magallanes is in, in the trading network of, of Manila. So waterways were uh, truly the conduit of commercial activity. I'm showing this because while we know this anecdotally through the historical record or through, you know, intuitively, we know that trade happens in waterways, there's I'm showing this as a means of conveying the accuracy and the effectivity of the methodology that space and tax actually works in quantifying uh, latent spatial behaviors that influence how city works. So, uh, and you see how rivers uh, and, and their steros actually connect to the broader network of our uh, broader fabric of our existing metropolis. And you'll also see how uh, the, the Pasig River connected to the various hacendas and uh, you know, um, farm areas outside of the core of Manila. That's how important Pasig River is. Now, when, when Burnham came, he proposed this centering uh, radial concentric grid around Intramuros and the Luneta Park. No? And again, as a, as a uh, example of unintended consequences, the, all these attempts to centralize and to define a city beautiful at the heart and core of, the, of Manila results to something else completely. Instead of, instead of just reproducing social democracy with the Washington Mall, like in Charles Lanfant's uh, DC, uh, Washington DC master plan, um, actually the Burnham plan shifts integration and the heart of activity and action away from the core and into the northern and southern integration course that you see here. So this is Sampaloc and Santa Cruz and Ermita and Malate. And oddly enough, if you visit Manila, Manila feels bisected. You, you do know that there's a northern, we, we do know that there's a northern and southern university belt. And then there's this kind of uh, open space in the middle that's not very activated at all. So uh, I think these are, you know, these are signs of how space and tax quantify something that we know intuitively by experience. Part of this, now the Burnham plan was not fully implemented, but if you look at the 1945 uh, map of Manila at the end of Spa American colonization, you, you'll see that uh, what, what the Burnham plan foreshadowed actually happened. And you will see that fracturing occurs because of the lack of these uh, uh, river crossings and because um, 
uh, the American planners or uh, administrators had no choice but to, to convert the riverside drives and activity areas that Burnham proposed for the Esteros and the, and the Pasig River. They had no choice but to convert them into industrial land uses. And when you have industrial land uses, you cut up the grain, uh, you enlarge the grain, and you prevent permeable movement between, between sides. And this has a very clear effect into this, on the spatial network of 1945 Manila. And I dare say up to now, that's exactly how, how our city configures uh, around the river. The river is now the back, I mean, we've turned our back uh, against the river. In 1967, you'll see that um, uh, the, the construction of EDSA, uh, the, the, the ring road of EDSA was completed. Uh, EDSA happens to be actually part of the war, uh, uh, war aid fund that, uh, that America uh, donated to the national government. And they constructed this uh, long ring road ar around, uh, around Manila with the objective of creating a bypass and reinforcing the federal consent decree. The irony is um, by creating this bypass road, it actually sucks all the integration away from the core of Manila into our, peri our peripheral edges. And you'll see that um, in some cases, the integration values of, of EDSA at that time, no, no, 1967, were already higher than the integration values of the traditional core of Manila, which is Binondo, Permita and uh, Malate. So in, in 1967, palang, if you were a prime speculator, real estate speculator, all you had to do was buy land on the edges of Manila and you were sitting on a future gold mine. And this points to how our city, our uh, enlarged uh, metropolis feels the same way. You know? it's, it also feels disjointed in that you have a northern, northern and southern half defined by the Pasig River outside of the core of Manila. So contemporary Metro Manila is defined now by uh, a lot of these privatized CBDs and the mixed use enclaves and gated residential areas. And um, you will see that if you run spatial analysis on these privatized en enclaves, um, this is, this is, these are lower ranges of movement and then these are vehicular ranges of movement. And you'll see that the red graph uh, is the spatial values of all these uh, of all these enclaves versus the rest of the graph of Manila, and you'll see that the spatial values of all these enclaves actually go uh, go ha have higher values for vehicular circulation ranges, which means that um, if you live in any of these uh, if you live in any of these uh, suburban areas. So if you, if you live in any of these suburban areas, you'll notice that uh, even if you're close to the CBD, it's actually easier for you to take a car or to, to take motorized transport than to walk to a nearby CBD. So it's no wonder why, uh, if you look at the uh, Metro Manila UTIS uh, JICA study, you'll see that all the traffic has no choice but to pass through that, that corridor defined by EDSA. And you'll see very little cross traffic through the river at the heart of our core. And part of this is because uh, we don't have enough crossings and also because the grain, the urban grain of our core is both, uh, is coarse, it's mixed grain, it's, you have small cuts and big cuts. And at the same time, uh, the road networks are not contiguous. They do not form uh, uh, constant uh, linear paths. So in a lot of ways, if you're, in this part of Manila, you're actually, it would actually be easier for you to just go to EDSA to cross to the southern half rather than to, to cross the river uh, directly. And uh, part, of, uh, part of that you can see here. No? So you'll see that um, the, yellow, the, the more yellow uh, uh, building is, the bigger the grain of the, of the, I mean, the bigger the size or the footprint of the building uh, and the, the more purple or pink that you see, the smaller or the more coarse grain the fabric is. And you see that the coarse grain fabric of Manila borders the river edges. And this in a way uh, prohibits our, the permeability between the two sides because 
it gets more congested no? as you as you go closer to the river. Uh, so can you imagine if you had a mega structural piece of uh, infrastructure like Parex connecting all these fine grained areas with high density, high velocity traffic? That that will destroy and disrupt the fabric of this entire core of Metro Manila. And uh, would actually induce more traffic and create more uh, uh, problems for, for the residents of these areas. Uh, we need to mend Manila's heart. And the only way to mend it is not through a grand infrastructural project, but through a lot of tactical measures that bridge over between, between both sides. Um, and as, as discussed in our preview, I mean, you can see in social media, the Counter proposal is a network of riverside esplanades and uh, crossings, uh, pedestrian and cycling crossings. These would complement greatly the fine grained nature of, of these riverside communities because most of these riverside communities probably don't have cars and probably have to rely on public transport. So if we create this network of esplanades and walkways and crossings, um, it allows them to cross over without having to rely on, on the grand uh, centrifugal uh, corridor of EDSA. Last bit that I wanted to, to point out, no? um, this might be a little off tangent. Uh, everybody presses the government to open the villages to, to allow uh, traffic to flow through the villages. Let me caution against that because I ran a simulation simulate, uh, showing that, testing that idea. And if you open the gates, what you're actually doing is you're, it's almost like creating new roads to access the CBDs. When the CBDs themselves do not have the capacity to take in more cars from all these open roads. So in a way you're creating more induced demand and you're literally suffocating the CBDs quite. That's why they're, they're like that. You will see this, a uh, perfect example of this is pre-pandemic. The northern, I mean, the Skyway, the, the, the SDX and Skyway during the mornings and afternoon rush hours, you'll see that um, cars queue going into Makati and have to queue going out because the absorptive capacity of the roads uh, in the Makati CBD are simply, the roads and the parking structures in the CBD are not simply not enough sufficient to carry all, all the incoming cars, the added cars that, that are going in. And we will recreate that same effect if Parex was, was to be constructed and to open up uh, and uh, go, I mean, to go down, down to the grade of these fine grain communities, we will suffocate them both literally and figuratively. So uh, that's it. Um, we can learn a lot from what Paris has done and what other cities have done. Hindi pa po patay ang Maynila, ang Metro Manila. Kung titignan niyo po yung history ng mga world cities like London, like New York, even Paris, hindi po maganda ang mga kasaysayan nila. Pero nagawa nila ng paraan. Huwag tayong bibitaw at huwag tayong susuko kasi kaya naman natin gawin yan. Kaso hindi natin masasolve yung mga ganitong problema by recycling old solutions. Parex was a good idea many years ago pero it's time to... Uh, leapfrog into the future. Go to Parex. Thank you.